She turned around and she said, look, I don't know you people. I'm not from the community. I don't know the rabbi. I saw. So I went into Eichler's to get something for Hanukkah. I saw the book there. I took it home. I read it to a six-year-old daughter. At the party, um, my uncle started fondling her. And she said, you're making me uncomfortable. Yelled it loud and ran to her mother. She broke down crying. I'll never forget her. She said, Rabbi, you saved my daughter's life. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and on this week's episode, I got to speak to Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz, someone who I've been wanting to speak to for more than a year at this point. He is someone who understands people, and he has a lot of experience with helping children succeed, whether they're just in yeshiva and they're trying to focus and just be better kids and better humans he's there for that and also on the sad side he he helps people um who who you know have gone through traumas and and you're probably realizing at this point this is a mature conversation so if if you're younger please ask an adult if you should be watching or listening to this but there are so many gems and i'm just thinking of the halo effect that he talks about and and um ashkacha pratis i i you know, when I started doing Inspiration for the Nation by myself, people are like, are you going to get a co-host? And I always had this idea. I would love to co-host uh, these episodes with with good friends of mine. And um, Yitzi Ingbury has a great podcast of his own, was there at the time. And, and it, it was such, it was perfect that he was there. He's so good at what he does. And, and together, Yitzi and I spoke to Rabbi Horowitz about teaching our children, being better parents, being better humans, and, and of course, factual things that help mitigate abuse, which is so important. Um, this is being released in, in the summertime. So um, especially, you know, with camps and all that, um, it, it's it's horrible and horrendous what happens in the world. And and Rabbi Hartz is someone who's really making this world a better place and, and you'll you'll see why everyone loves him. He's so likable and and he's so insightful. So without further ado, well, there's further ado. This this podcast uh, episode is in memory of Shimon David Ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miriam Sara Bas Yaakov Moshe the Neshama Shavan Leah. Now, without further ado, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Here we are with Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz. I know you're very busy, so thank you for giving us your time. A pleasure. I didn't realize you lived in Florida. Yes. So I'm like, yeah, we'll just do it. And you're like, I happen to be in New York now, so it's very shkaka protest. So I, I want you to take us back to, I guess, the beginning of your career and, I guess, your involvement in the space that you are right now. Okay, so first of all, happy birthday. Thank you. I don't know when we're hearing this. It could, I could be like 31 by that point. But whatever. whatever <laughs> no, no, it'll be a lot sooner than that. Non-judgmental. So um, <clears throat> I started, I started, well, actually it started back when I was in school <laughs> and uh, as an energetic, restless, out of the box thinker, you could imagine that package doesn't work well in eighth grade. So I, I, I always, school was just extremely challenging for me. And, you know, back in the day, my teachers were Holocaust survivors of that age, you know, there were no timeouts in my day. Right. They're very tough, <laughs> yeah, uh, very whatever. tough generation. So yeah, you know, it was much more authoritarian. Um, so I, you know, I really didn't do much learning till I was in high school and just one day decided to, to get started. But, um, so I, I actually started my career in education when I was 22. I, uh, volunteered to teach the, an eighth grade boys, all boys yeshiva, primarily Gemara, but other Judaic studies subjects. And, um, I volunteered to teach the track that hadn't yet been successful, um, those those students of mine are 52 now. Wow. <laughs> so I actually, I'm planning to do a live with them, an Instagram live with them, because I'm doing, in my daily parenting clips, I'm doing teaching Chumash and Gemara, skills-based, um, using all different types of modalities. I want to talk about their high school experience, their eighth grade experience with me. I'm wow. setting it up there. It's fascinating. It's just a fascinating study. Anyway, so um, I, I just fell in love with it. I, I just loved every moment of it. 
And um, I did that for 15 years, and first in Brooklyn and then later in Muncie. And um, in 1996, I wrote, a, I wrote an article um, in the Jewish Observer that was uh, Agudas Monthly, a very long, the first thing I'd ever written in my life. It's a 4,500-word essay, and it was called An Ounce of Prevention. And it basically said, look, we're losing a percentage of our children to religion. It doesn't have to be this way. Here are some things that we could do. And I spoke about <clears throat> some of the, exactly what I'm working on now, you know, teaching different modalities, understanding children, um, understanding that not all children learn the same way, learn the same style, have the same, um, you know, uh, ability to sit still for long periods of time. So my life changed overnight. I had this really nice, quiet life in Muncie. Nobody, uh, I just went to work, came home, played with the kids. And like... I can't even begin to describe to you. We we got hundreds and hundreds of calls every month, and imagine we got we got a hundred letters to that letters. I'm really dating yeah. myself. <clears throat> we got it was it was just extraordinary. What at that time was it like? I'm sure even now it's kind of taboo, but was then a really taboo time to Be, beyond beyond beyond. I mean, you you look back. Nobody, Rabbi Zachary Greenwald wrote a piece about it mildly like five six years before me but there was no the term at risk nobody knew what you're talking about you know um so you know some of the responses were I, I, we got some people called and said you know i'm the messiah i'm the melech mashiach for saying what they've been thinking for whatever years others said that uh you know i'm i'm the devil for for bringing up for embarrassing the community but honestly 90 percent of the people were begging for help there were no agencies, there was nothing. Oh, hell, Children's Home and Rabbi Trenks, that's all, had uh, Adelphi Yeshiva, that was it. If, so, he, if he needed anything differently, there just was nothing. So what happened after that? Like, now that, okay, the article came out, you're somewhat a lot more talked about because of what you said. Right, so what revolved was I went to Rabbi Sheriz, that's all, who's the head of the Agudah, and I said, I'm, I'm just a guy, I need help. So in his great vision and tremendous courage, he... He gave me an open mic at the Agoda Convention. I was 37 years old. He didn't know what I would say. And, and we started Project Yes together, which was a program for teens at risk. Um, we originally started with a mentoring program. We started, um, we had a list of 130 kids in the New York area who were not in any school at all, ranging in age from 12 to 16. Uh, at the time, again, there were no alternative yeshivas, so schools were more reluctant to send kids away because you were basically throwing them in the street. But the children that needed something different had no place, so they were literally in the streets. So, I mean, the public at large doesn't understand this piece of it. Rabbi Shara took me to the Metzis Gedalia Torah, to the Gedolim, and most of them are in Ganeidin, you know, the Novi Metzgerevi, my Rebbe Rav Pams, that's how, you know the previous generation's senior gedolim, senior um, sages. And he, he, like, a, I was so nervous. It was like at a board meeting. They were all sitting around, and I, I, he asked me to present what I saw. I told him. I told him exactly what I was seeing. And I, I was shocked. They asked me what I thought the best thing to do was. So I said, look, I, I checked these kids. They have 130. The average, there were between four and eight yeshivas each. They were veterans of between four and eight yeshivas each. So I said, Rashi Yeshiva Shlita, you know, this is, the next yeshiva is not going to be any different. They need something different. What do you mean by what did you, you told them what you saw? What did you see? I told them that I saw kids in the street, nice kids who were just boosting cars and doing crazy because wow. they, they had nothing to do. So when you say at risk, what do you mean at risk of At what? risk meaning... Of delinquency. Of yeah, truancy, delinquency, of, truancy, understanding you, them. It's just all really about understanding them. You know, If they would have been kids 150 years ago, they'd be working on a farm. They'd be fine. So we have this beautiful system that we have a yeshiva system, thank God. So that doesn't work. You know, in, in my yeshiva, I was a school principal for, for 22 years. I started yeshiva in Muncie after my eighth grade experience. So I had very strict HIPAA rules. HIPAA, you know, like medically, don't talk about patients in the hallway. So we never discussed students in the hallway. But we had like a code that I used to, for a few, one of the things we said was 40 regular, 40 regular um, alterations and custom. That was, that was our code in the yeshiva for children, what they needed. So 40 regulars, you know, you suit, you fit. You're 40 regular, you go into the suit, say, fix the sleeves, I'm out. 
uh, custom means, you know, one, one foot's a little longer than the other, you got a tip, a, 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 a tuck, a nip there. And altera- a custom is just like, you need like, phew, this body doesn't fit anything. So that's the way kids are. There's 40 regular, and there's alterations, and then there's custom. So the 130 custom kids. Custom kids doesn't fit, and you should, look at the adults, forget the kids, just go, go. Go into a restaurant. Go into a business. Just look around. You can, you can pick the kids. You're, you're so inspiring that you go through a, a thing yourself that causes you heartache, and then you created a school to ameliorate the situation. Like, who actually does that? That's amazing. What tikkun olam? What, like... I, I mean, to, in my opinion, that's what life is about. You learn from your experiences. And, and, you know, it either makes you bitter and hard and angry, which I didn't say I wasn't, I lost my father when I was three, you know, he had stuff. But, um, you know, I still haven't figured that one out, but, you know, theologically. But whatever, you can't figure everything out. But um, I'm saying that you, you either get angry or bitter, or you say, I would love to, I'll find meaning by um, helping kids avoid that. That's, that's how I see things. You know, your experiences, why do we say, Zechel Etzias Mitzrayim? all over the place, by Kiddush, the remembering of us leaving Egypt. Well, what's that all about? I think that the Torah is telling us that, remember that we were slaves, and it's, it's part of our culture, it's part of our DNA, it's part of our history. So either you could be compassionate when you see racism or other things or people being mistreated or, or child abuse victims or, or kids who aren't making it in school or anything, or, or, or so you could either say, hey, I put my time in, and it's tough luck, you deal with it. You know, and you just get hard and callous. So you say, I remember, yeah, I remember what that was like. That's how I see it, you know, that, that's, that's what it's all about. So you mentioned that um, abuse, and that's right. something that you're obviously very passionate about talking about and, and right. preventive. So at what point did you, I guess, shift <coughs> from this focus on kids at risk to, you know, kids getting abused? Right, so, so it was a journey that I, went on myself, you know, that I, that, I, that I had to go through to try to figure things out. Like, I, I don't, I'm just, this week, the topic of, I do weekly parenting clips, it's at Bright Beginnings Forum on Instagram, and um, this week's topic is called The Answer Key, and it's my philosophy that every child has an answer key. You see, they're doing something, doesn't make sense to you, don't respond till you figure it out, because there's a reason, there's an answer key child doesn't come with the homework every day, there's a reason. Maybe they're disorganized, maybe their home situation is chaotic, maybe they got, they have a parent in the hospital. So if I just tell, give the kid a punishment, like, you just make it worse. So find out what's going on. It's like doing surgery without taking a CAT scan, you know? So I always told that to myself as a Rebbe, the first, always. I said, kid knocked out, something's going on. What's going on, Yankee? Figure it out or keep quiet till you do. So I was looking around at the, the kids that we were dealing with um, and I noticed that a very significant percentage were abused. It was, a, it was actually it was one of the things that I shared with the Gedolim at the time. This was my own finding, my own understanding of things, that there were actually two categories of kids who were abandoning religion. It sounded the same because a parent would call and say, my kid's not keeping Shabbos, my kid's not uh, you know, religiously observant, <clears throat> or diminished religious observance. But there were actually two groups, and it, it took me a few years to really get my hands around it. But like Rabbi Shara trained me to share it with the Gadol and with the Rabbanim. I'm very candid. I'm, of course, I'm deeply respectful, and they support what I do. But so w- one of the things I said was is that there, there are groups, I call it Ozvimet Adat, uh, abandoning religion. Dat is religion. Dat. Um, abandoning religion and abandoning life. So it's totally different things, and when people conflate them, it, it, the diagnosis is not right, and, and so ozvimet adat, abandoning religion only, means you have an adolescent or an adult who's happy in school, in college, college working, uh, social life, you know, the train is moving forward. You know, God's not a part of it right now, so the parents call and say, my kid's not, so I, I learned to listen and, and listen more than talk and try to hear what's going on. So that's Ozumet Adat. And I find that there are dozens of reasons for for it. There are patterns. I I did a lot of interviews. I, 
you know, I spoke to hundreds of kids who abandoned religion to get the answer key. Mm-hmm. I actually did surveys of kids who abandoned religion. How many years were you not religious before you told anyone? And what was the cause? And what would you advise parents who have non-religious kids to do? You know, so that's Ozumet, that's one bucket. But the other bucket is Ozumet Achayim. God forbid they're abandoning life. They're not in school. They're not moving forward. They're not happy that they're not optimistic about the future, and they're basically self-destructing. So I call that as a that they're leaving life. Um, and after a lot of reflection and, and data, looking over whatever I saw, um, I said at the time that 90% were abused, and 90% were more. It's probably closer to 100. Of the second bucket of people? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, are you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I am not. So please. So it's a, it's a it's a it's basically a brilliant theory. Abraham Maslow, nice Jewish boy, <laughs> he came up with this concept of of a hierarchy of needs, and he says basically, you want to tell my, you know, money. I would <laughs> not do that. So, so I'm sorry for you on the spot. I'm not a good educator. So, <clears throat> so I enjoyed that. So that was good. So, so <laughs> that what that I messed yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good friend of mine. Put him on the spot. Yeah. So, so Maslow says that there are five um, levels of human needs, and they're sequential. Like, you can't become a, a, a captain if you're not a sergeant. So, I meaning it's sequential. You got to go from the bottom up, and it's a brilliant theory. It has some questions on it, but you know, by and large. I really, all my interactions with children, with adult, with my learning and everything in life, and my professional life, I really follow Maslow's thinking as far as this goes. So the, the lowest level is physiological needs, food, shelter, sleep. Uh, the second is security, safety, just feeling comfort. The third is socialization, uh, friend, love, relationships, all of that. But then comes self-esteem. Um, you know, feeling good about yourself. And then the top one is self-actualization. We call it Yiddish to steig, to grow, to develop. What the marine ad be all you can be? So, Maslow, Just do it. Wait, that's just, Nike. Just do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Mix my ads. Um, so so the, the, the theory is that if you're missing one of those lower levels, if you haven't slept in two days, so like, and then you want to try to engage in a self-actualization, you want to study for a test, you kidding me? Like, you know, I need sleep. I'm, I haven't eaten. Matzi Yom Kippur, you meet him. You meet Jason. You say, hey, how you doing? How are you? And he comes over to talk to you. <laughs> you know, go away from me. <laughs> like, you know, I, I need to eat. Go, go. Away. I don't know. So it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. What so, were your questions on that theory, though? It sounds like you had some reservations. I, no, no, no. Uh, pinpoints, little little things. Okay. No, no, little stuff. I mean, not, not, no theory is perfect. Um, if you're interested, I'll take it offline. <laughs> I, have, I have some questions, so just anecdotally, but it's a brilliant theory, and I found it almost immutable. It's almost like a fact. So, car breaks down. You leave here, you know, tonight, 10 o'clock at night, your car breaks down, bad neighborhood, 2% on your battery. You're not feeling safe, right? You see some folks coming to you that look a little scary. Anything in this world that's above that you might be in a relationship and someone you love, you're dating, you're talking, your spouse, your friends. You know, not now, right? And self actualization it's almost funny. Like, imagine you had a life coach, and he called you then, and he said, he or she, he said, you know, remember we were working on those five-year goals? Like, where do you see yourself? Did you work on that? And you say, like, I don't know if I'll be alive in five minutes. So the lacking those bottom ability, uh, uh, situations, the comfort, of having the physical needs met and this, nothing else works. So when I saw kids who were Ozumet HaChayim, who were abandoning life, I thought to myself, they're missing one or two. Like a kid comes to my class and, and just curses me or does something crazy. You know, you know. So what's the answer key? But you, when you see self-destructive behavior, you say, it's got to be one or two. It's nothing. It's not that complicated. You just look at it like Maslow, walk out now and start thinking the next two days like Maslow. I can almost guarantee you it'll just open your eyes to, to, to a totally new way of looking at it. It's funny things. you say that because I know, I think Jason actually pointed out to me that when, like, if I'm in a bad mood, it's like, first think, wait, am I tired or hungry? 
And it's so true. They Whenever don't... I'm in a bad mood, I'm usually just hungry. And then like, I eat a shawarma. And then, and then you're good? And then I'm okay. <clears throat> so it's, it's very interesting. You I point promise out. you, this is a true story. I, I was lecturing at a Pesach program a few years ago. And a guy came over to me. And he's a guy of a big shul in Brooklyn. And there were many fights going on in shul. And he's a brilliant businessman. Just a, with kindred souls. Like he's such an out-of-the-box thinker. So he analyzed it, and he said, all the fights are starting after 10.30. Shab Davening starts at 9 o'clock. Mm-hmm. He said, the guys are cranky, they need a shawarma. Yeah. So he went to the Rav. The Rav asked him to solve this, just solve this. I, I, I tried, nobody's listening. I say, stop fighting, they don't listen to me. You're an out-of-the-box guy. He was the president of the shul. He said, solve this. He came back to him. He said, he, I just looked around, and I, he, he's, he happens to be like an accountant type, you know, so mm. he's very data-driven. Right. So he... Everything after 10.30. So he told the Rav, make a kiddush. Right. I promise you, no kidding. He said, before laning, they would stop, make a 15-minute kiddush. Nobody fought anymore. Nothing. Wow. Brilliant. Very smart. So so this what was, so when I would meet children, uh, 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 these 130 kids, I would look and say like, what's going on? I had a, a, Usually it was explained, it was stuff going on at home, this, that, mm-hmm. whatever. There were six kids at the time, it was about 2002. I, was, I had been doing this for five years, and I, had an, I knew all the families. Everything was right. They had one and two solid, rock solid, and unfortunately the kids were, just, excuse me, totally self-destructing, and it made no sense, and it has to make sense. So I had this crazy idea, I said, oh my God, they were abused. I said, there was like a neutron bomb, blew them up. So I called the six parents. I said, was there any trauma? Every single one said no. I said, please check. Six out of six. Wow. It took a few months for them to get back to me until they figured it out. Were you, were you certain at that point or you were like, I'm I knew there was something. There's something. There like, has to be something. You, you know, when you analyze stuff, it has to be. It doesn't make sense. It's like I said, if they're not religious, if they hate school, that's fine. So go play basketball all day. Go play whatever. You know, go shoot pool. They weren't doing that. They were just destroying themselves. So you say, it can't be. There has to be a reason. Anyway, so I started, I started looking around. And I started, uh, so I started writing about it and screaming and yelling. You look at my articles, the original articles that I wrote those years, you could see the panic in my voice. I look back on it. It's still scary because nobody believed me. I thought I was crazy. I was talking, I said, guys, there's thousands of victims. Like, what are you crazy? People like my best friends came from Yankee. Yankee, you sound a little weird. You know, stop it. Stop it. You sound like a little, you know, something wrong with you. I, I knew that it was true, so I just refused to stop. So I just kept talking about it. I toned it down a little bit. I started writing. I started writing about different details. And then <clears throat> over the course of time, you know, I wasn't the only one. There were a few of us, but not many. Um, and then when it became people started to realize what well, there were a few high, high-profile scandals and other things like that that, by the way, are the, uh, very good learning experiences. And um, once, once we started realizing what was going on, I decided to try to prevent it. And, and that's what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm really concentrating on prevention. Uh, what can you do to stop this? And, and th- it's really remarkable h- how effective child safety education is. Because the abuser, I, I looked into this, I spoke to, I'm not a therapist, I, I never do therapy. I, I see my role as sending people to resources and as a rabbi, encouraging them that this is legit and, and please go get help. <clears throat> so one of the things, speaking to experts in the Jewish world and the secular world and reading lots of books, what emerged was is that I, I, I was in depression almost, like, because how do you stop this? A little a big guy wants to abuse a little kid, how are you going to stop the abusers go through a grooming process. They try to figure out who's, who it's safe to abuse, just like uh, someone doing a financial scam looks in a room and says, who can I, who can I, you know, who can I do a scam on? Who can I get? They call up like Bubby, you know? Right, Bubby, right. Bubby widowed, uh, but there's a, there's a catch there, right. Bubby may have been an accountant, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a scam and you have, let's say, papers that you want someone to sign, Unless you have ADD and didn't take your meds, you're not bringing those papers to the first meeting. You see a Bubby or you see his ID. <laughs> now that I'm a Florida, I got lots of them. <laughs> right? So, so if, you look, if you look at, um, you have a perfect mark, right? You see someone, you say, this is a person. Or a couple couples is also great. 
right? They're not financially knowledgeable. They got 20 grand in wedding presents. They don't know what to do with it. So you, again, if you have a, a contract for a phony real estate deal or, you know, whatever, if you bring that to the first meeting, you, you, it's suicidal because you don't know what they know, right? Who they know, and what, how knowledgeable they are. They'll look through it and say, this is a bubble. Let me look it up online. I have a friend in the, you know. So you want to find out how financially knowledgeable your mark is. And even if they're not, even if it's a Bubby or a Zadie or a Cole couple, they, who do they know? So those are the two things that you're not going to move forward until, until you, you check those things out. You check the boxes. So you'll go out for coffee and say, tell me a little bit. How, how are you? Uh, Jason, I saw, you know, do, what do you know about mortgages? I have this great deal. Mm -hmm. So you'll say, oh, yeah, my, my dad's a mortgage broker. <laughs> so I don't see <clears throat> I can go through books. There's a woman, Dr. Ann Salter, she spent 20 years uh, interviewing serial pedophiles in prison. That was the first book I read. That's, oh my God. But they all said the same thing. They, sure, they, they would check and look, and, and, and they go through this process. They're terrified of kids who are educated. They're terrified of kids who speak to their parents. That's it. So you teach kids. I mean, there's supervision. There are other pieces of it. Wow. There's a community wow. piece. That's what I discovered. I said, oh my God, this is... Why don't we do this? Well, I, I blew up when you said terrified of speaking to their parents. I didn't even hear the second one. That's, that's I'm sorry, what do you mean? What the are the two components? That? The two components, basically, again, this is Yankee. This is not the literature. I'm just, this is anecdotally mm -hmm. my take on it. It doesn't say it like this in the literature, but sure. I'm extrapolating from it. The, the, the things that they're afraid of are children who are educated about their bodies, mm -hmm. who are comfortable talking about their body parts, who, it, it's not sex education, it's body awareness. That's why a lot of people were thrown when we first started doing the child safety books. They thought I was doing sex education at a young age. No, 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 no. We want to keep our children naive. And I say, you're doing the pedophiles a tremendous gift. You're giving them a gift. Oh, gosh. That's why I, I promise you I would say that. I, right. I, I didn't say it that boldly, but mm -hmm. I would say something a little milder than that. So you realize you're just making them more vulnerable now. If they're not educated and they don't know that... They, and if what does that mean, body awareness for children? Body awareness means they have a right to personal space. Mm -hmm. I, I, we published a book with ArtScroll. I, I, Rabbi Meir Zlatter would say, um, it's incredibly bold. It's called Let's Stay Safe. He, he published it. We co-published it. We're in 130,000 homes already. In Yiddish, in English, with two Hebrew versions. Um, Chaim Kanievsky's daughter gave us, uh, Chaim Kanievsky gave us a letter for the Hebrew version. But people, th there isn't one thing, I said it's the Tzniah's book. This is the Tzniah's book. It talks about personal space, and it has nothing to do with sex. It's about space. It's about establishing a norm that, that children can say if they feel uncomfortable. There's four messages, you know. Mm -hmm. no, now you know, now that you know the two things, so no secrets from parents, your body belongs to you, okay? Uh, that means... Um, things belong to me. Uh, how old does a kid have to be to know something belongs to them? You know, it's, it's 12 months old already. They start yelling, yelling if you take away a blankie of theirs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's good touching, bad touching. Some touching is okay, some touching is not okay. And the fourth is no one has the right to make you feel uncomfortable. That if you're in a, an uncomfortable spot, get out. And, and um, when you train children like that, and that becomes the norm if someone gets into their space, the first thing they do is they go like that. And the abuser says, uh-oh, I'm out of here. Ha are there any abusers that are just really dumb and they don't even pick up? Like a kid saying like, you're making me uncomfortable and they're stupid, they'll, they'll it, get caught. It, it's under 2%, wow. under 5% are one-offs. You know, that they just go over and abuse a kid. It's less than 5%. Wow. So and, and, and it's not likely to be strangers. It's likely to be people in that inner circle or that second circle of people they know. And um, you, I wouldn't say try it, but you can observe it. You, you can see right away when children um, speak up and, and say things. So by training parents to, to do this, um, you, you're really saving the children's lives. I mean, it's just as simple as that. We, we got, I'll never forget it, the, when the, the book came out, um, like a few weeks later, I did a talk in Shalamis High School, uh, elementary school. It was in Brooklyn. They had a campus in Brooklyn at the time. There were like three, four hundred people there. It was right after Hanukkah. And um, 
a, a non-observant woman was sitting in the front row. Um, she, I finished a presentation. Uh, we had copies of the book there, and she asked if she could. She has a question. She raised her hand. She says, "Can I speak to the parents?" It was like an auditorium. She turned around and she says, "Look, I don't know you people. I'm not from the community. I don't know the rabbi. I saw. So I went into Eichler's to get something for Hanukkah. I saw the book there. I took it home. I read it to a six-year-old daughter at the party." Um, my uncle started fondling her. And she said, you're making me uncomfortable, yelled it loud and ran to her mother. She broke down crying. I'll never forget it. She said, Rabbi, you saved my daughter's life. And we've gotten probably thousands of communications from parents like that in the last 11 years. Does that feeling ever get jaded for you? Never. Because I know what it looks like. I know, you know, all too well what what it looks like for the survivors that their lives. I wouldn't say that. God forbid, doesn't mean they can't live beautiful lives, but their lives are never the same again. When people would yell, it was, they would say that they're giving the sentences are too long. You know, the abusers watch they go away for forty years, whatever. So the first thing I would say, listen, if I'll, I'll think about, you know, you want if you want to encourage parole, take them into your grandkids' house. <laughs> You know, if you take him into, sign on to, you'll take him, you know, that's all. But the other thing I say, the only one who has life sentence is the, is the survivor, the abuse, the abuse victim. The, 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 you know. So when, when you know, you see what, what horror it is on the other side, I'm just so passionate about um, preventing it. And it's beyond meaningful that I know that we created something, um, our team, it's not me, I mean the group, we created something that, that really stops this. It's not, again, it's not perfect. I'm, I'm actually doing now, child, I call it Child Safety 2.0. I just did a talk here in, um, a few months ago, and um, they did a Faraka in one of the white shul, and they did the colors, they did the red shul here in, yeah. in the five towns and the white shul in, the, in Farakaway. I, I came up with this new concept, it's called Child Safety 2.0. Because, in my humble opinion, the literature, like what I mentioned to you, those four things, and the general child safety education, I think there are some gaps there, that like supplemental information that parents need, and I've been speaking about it lately, and and, and you know I'm doing, I'm launching something, you know, next uh, in a couple next couple of weeks to, um, to get that information out to the broader population. In other words, um, there there are there are so many powerful, um, it's almost like a gravitational pull that lets abusers get away with it. If you look at the high profile stuff, these guys with the wall that was doing it for 25 years, how the heck did he get away with it for so long? You think about it, how did he get away with it? Right, right. And, but, and it's all this here in America, you know, Weberman, I mean, any of the other cases there, you see they got a, hundreds of victims, you know, there. So there are things that I think um, people should know, and that's, I hope Hashem should give me the strength in many more years, that I, I really want to push that 2.0 package of information out. Again, it's not in the literature. Can you, can you give us a taste? Sure, sure, sure. Um, one of them is the halo effect, let's say. Um, the, I won't ask if you know it. <laughs> the halo is effect. that effect you, you coined, or it's... it's no, a... no, no, this is all research. Okay, I, 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 what I'm saying is, th these are known things, you can Google them. I was an eighth grade Rebbe, you can Google now. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so, they didn't have Google in my days, thank <laughs> God. But, but I've actually, I, I was smirking a little bit about the halo effect. I, I'm familiar, but I have no idea how you're about to apply it in this context. Okay. So, it's so, interesting, yeah. Want to tell me what you know about it? No. <laughs> okay, so the halo... Yes, you're over too. I, no, I didn't say, you, I didn't test you. I just wanted to know if you wanted to share, you know. <laughs> so, the halo effect was research done, originally was done in the army, that they discovered that people who are put together, the handsome, attractive soldiers, were getting better grades from the sergeants not only on um, leadership, which you could say is a little nebulous, but even like a marksmanship and stuff that was data, they would just do better. And, and there's tons of research on this. You walk into a room and you see, um, you see people put, the, like if I came in here with a torn shirt, I could be saying exactly what I'm saying, but I, I, when I hit the door, right, if I came in and you know, whatever my, I'm not the most organized guy in the world. If my wife didn't check me before I left the house, yeah. you know, when I came in with mismatched shoes, 
you would look at this like, what's this guy doing here? And then I talk and you say, oh, it makes sense. I don't know if we would pathologize that sort of behavior. I think, we, I think we would be welcoming to it. I, I didn't say you would judge me, but your, your initial reaction is like, this guy's coming to talk about education and child safety, can't even pick the shoes on. Mm-hmm. That's just the way it is. If he was wearing this, like a sneaker and like a, like a black a sn- shoe, well, I'd be like, if I had to what's going on over or here? Or if my, my language wasn't good or if I, or if I wasn't groomed well. It just, that's, listen, it's, it's rude if you apply it and, and you make fun of the person, but you can't help your internal bias. So what happens is, that, that's the halo effect, period, full, full stop. And, and there are a lot of results. Of, as a result of the halo effect, they change the way we grade papers. Are you aware? I don't know if you're aware. In other words, you take a New York State Regents exam, so they give you three essays. So the graders don't do one, they don't do your paper and your paper, they do all number ones and they cover the name, and then somebody else does number twos. Why? Because if someone gets a great number one, you'll read number two and you'll say, well, you know, you probably thought of that and didn't really write it. That's just the way we are. That's the way we are. You make assumptions based on past. It's very powerful. I, I, example I give a practical one is you're, you're in shul, and the guy who reads the Torah hasn't made a mistake in 40 years. He's perfect. He's like a machine. One day he makes a mistake. You see it. Do you speak up? Do you get up and say, whoa, whoa? Definitely not. I do not. I'm probably not there. And if I'm there, <laughs> and if I'm there, I let it ride. There you go. But, but yeah, the average person in shul is not going to speak yeah, up because yeah, this guy's perfect and I'm just Yankee Horowitz. So you'll, you'll have the most extraordinary rationales in your head why you didn't see what you saw, which is exactly what happens by abuse. Mm. That's the, that's that's the Anki. That's the anecdotal. Uh, my comment on this. That's what happens by abuse. So you see somebody alone with a woman or a girl or a child in a room by themselves, and you say, "What's that all about?" But it's oh, it's Rabbi so and so. Oh, you know. So it must be, yeah. It's, you know, he does good work and whatever. Mm-hmm. That's how Walter gets away with it. That's how women get. That's how they get away with it because there's a halo effect, and the guy doesn't make a mistake in forty years. You're not going to be the one yelling that because they're going to look at you. Maybe you, maybe you read it wrong. Maybe Art Scroll made a mistake. Maybe this guy's grandfather has a reason that he reads it this way. You will not say anything in all likelihood. Nobody will, or very few people will. So that's what happens. We give a, a lot of leeway to people who look a certain way from our tribe. By the way, it's not. Jews, look at Penn State, look at the Catholic Church. It, it's everywhere, religious, not only. This, this is a human condition. Mm-hmm. Bill Cosby, what else do you need, right? Bill, how do you get away with it all alone? It's nuts. How what? Many, no, I'm saying there's, there's like, you always hear things in, in Hollywood. Bill Cosby was like next level of how many people he raped. Right, and, and, like, and. And it took so long. But look how respected he was. Right. Look how respected he was. And nobody believes it. In, in your mind, you still don't believe it. Right. Even when they do weird things, look what Michael Jackson was doing. Look what Michael Jackson—he had kids all around. He was in bed, you know. We're like, wow. And but he was a performer. Everybody liked to beat it, whatever it is, you know. So that we, we, so my this child safety 2.0 is teaching parents. If you know about this, you have a better chance of speaking up when something happens because you you can feel it affecting you, and then you can say, hey, I know what that is. I'm that they're doing the. This is the halo effect. Let me analyze it a little more carefully. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, we're talking about raising children and what better way to provide kosher content for your kids than with Yidflix. Yes, that is true. Made by Yidin, for Yidin. It is the content that's... I wish we had this 20 years ago, honestly. You know, I I wish I grew up with Yidflix... Um, I, I was exposed to Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon and Disney Channel, and and while there was some good stuff there, there was a lot of bad stuff there. But with Yidflix, you know, it's kosher content for your kids and for adults. Frankly, you know, we have a lot of Living Lachaim content that you could find there. So check out Yidflix in the show notes. And now back to the episode with Rabbi Horowitz. 
You're such a boss that this is like what you made your life's work to be, to challenge the dominant discourse about particular figures. Well, you see, you're society. a lawyer, so you're doing a lot of good for the world also. <laughs> I want to beat yourself up for that. Just in different ways. <laughs> I'm beating myself up about it. No, but it, that, look, you know, like I said, you come, you come to life with your experiences and, and you try to make the so world better. on that, with your experiences, you mentioned that your father passed away at three yes. years old. Like, I might be doing a bit of a stretch here, but I'm just trying to understand is all of your work born out of the fact that maybe you lost this incredibly important figure in your life and then you're just trying to crave, like, how can I make the world make sense? How can I make the world better? How can I reconcile? That's a great question. I, I was asked this at a, I was doing a, uh, I was doing a, uh, I was at a panel, uh, um, like a presentation for a, a secular Jewish foundation, and I was talking about leadership and about making uh, societal change without, that's the hardest thing to do, by the way, is not to scream and not to, in other words, to make change in a way that people can listen rather than throw furniture around. That is the hardest thing to do because sometimes you just want to. Right, you're doing it within the system, you're changing. Right? It's amazing. Right. Do you, I, I, I made a, the Yiddish book, the, our Yiddish version of our book, I made it together with the leaders of the Satma community in Monroe. We sold them 7,000 books, and they gave one to every family there. I sat, me, I sat with them for a year. Look, it, To it, break into that insular community, to lobby, to sat, collaborate and with, I sat them, down to with them, to work and, and, with them. And I've been advocating for abuse survivors, and some of them were from the community, and it was a lot of, I, I just said, look, the only thing that's going to stop this is education. It's not about me. It's not about you. We agree. We don't agree on. We might not agree on other pieces. Let's just. We know that education. Amazing. But but I'm saying like you asked me about my father. So I, I was let, I was talking to them about leadership and making change organically. And, and woman said, "Where did you get this empathy from? Where did you get this for for victims?" So I, I said, I, "I wouldn't." And I'm answering your question in, in a roundabout way, but I said that I I I, I empathize with people who need a break, you know, with people who are voiceless. That's that's really what it is. In other words, whether it's a child in class who doesn't understand how Gemara works, or it's a, an abuse survivor, or, or, you know, a single mom that's struggling to make it all work, um, like, I naturally empathize with them. Um, so she asked me if I'd rather have, would I rather have had my father back and, and, and not be, and not have those attributes. She, she really, uh, she really challenged me. So I said, um, I'd probably take him back, you know, mm. but whatever. Look, I, I, I do classes on, on blended families. I've written about it extensively about my, my, my mother remarried and, you know, we sat shiva for, we didn't use the word, at, we, we, we called it the S word. We didn't use the step word in our house. Mm. <laughs> My, my, my mother remarried. She was married to we, Abba. We didn't, we, I said we didn't use stepfather. Uh, and they did a remarkable job of blending our families. But uh, like that's, that's really my passion, to try to, um, to try to be a voice for the voiceless and to try to, to educate the public at large. I mean, I think, I, think people, I think people inherently are decent and would like to do the right thing. And sometimes we just, you know, we're caught up in thinking a certain way. And... You know, to me, I'm an educator, so everything is about education. Everything is about education. You wanna, you're upset about something, you're upset something's going on, educate the people. Try to offer your way of thinking. You might think differently than they do, um, but sit down and try to explain it to them in a rational way, in a way that they can understand it, not to, in other words, if you're sitting with academics, uh, I'll, I'll call it research only, you know, a lot of studies, this study, that study, be sitting with, Amcho, as we say, you know, you're sitting with regular folks. You talk to them in a language. It's not about showing them how bright I am, you know, or I'm not. You know, you talk about them. You want, you realize you want to talk to them on their level. I, I don't know if you saw it. I said you, you saw the my beginner Gemara Chumash books. Yeah, I, I saw that, but talk to about it to those that don't so know what it is. Yeah, I have no idea. Oh my goodness, I have the. That's my passion. My passion is really. That's your education. passion. I feel like this is your passion. <laughs> it's the same thing. Though. He said that three times already. Right? Yeah, he was very passionate about it. But it's the same thing. So tell us, tell us about that. So I've always felt um, that that we're rushing our children through Judaic studies, learning, Lumudei uh, Kodesh, Chumash, Gemara, without teaching them the the skills, the fundamental skills. Um, Two hundred and seventy. Uh, Sharashim root words uh, are ninety three percent of all the words in Chumash. So and there's 
less than 20 prefixes and suffixes. So if you teach the children how it works, the system, they're off to the races. It takes time to teach it to them. It needs training and you need visual material. And it, uh, initially, rote teaching is easier because when they start off, they, they can just parrot the words back. But they have to memorize every single word for absolutely no reason. It dulls the brain, rote learning, it's not. But there's a whole ton of research on it. Are you an academic? The skull. Uh, <laughs> but I'm saying like this, it, it doesn't work. Um, so I, we published a beginner Chumash book. Um, to really, with graphics, to give the children the skills. And once they, they learn, they, they just go. Th think about the word, Amar, it's to say, right? Vayomer, Lamer, Imri, uh, Amarti, Amarta, you know, there's, there's 20 permutations of that. If you don't know how the system works, you can, you have to memorize 20 words for no reason. Mm. Just teach, especially with Gemara. So we published a beginner Gemara book that has an explanation of who these people are, I um, want to get that. I never heard about that. I want to get this book. I do a 50... It can go on my, on my YouTube page. It's Yaakov, it's Yaakov Horowitz. Um, ground floor to art scroll in an hour. I, do a, I designed a 55-minute class for single mothers to be able to do homework with their kids. Never open the Mishnayas. Never open the Gemara. I, you'll be able to do... And it's free. I could just go on YouTube the, and watch YouTube it. YouTube is long. Yeah, I mean, I have a book, but you don't need the book for it. Wow. But I, I teach them the background, and I say, you can go pick up an art scroll, and you'll be able or, uh, you know, uh, uh, any of the other translation, they can do homework with the kids. 55 minutes. Try it out. Could take someone who... Look, pick a guy in your office who's not religious. Just sit him down. Explosively wholesome. <laughs> to be, like, making content for single moms to be able to do... Home. Well, I, I, I was glowing, I was facetious I, when I started it. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful organization called Sister to Sister. Mm -hmm. So they support, my mother's a single mom, you know, she was divorced, but so they have, uh, they have 600 members, you know. So when I was there, there were 300, then they did that. They were at a Shabbos retreat. So they asked me what I want to talk about. They asked me to come, so I came. So what do you want to speak about? Who else is, who are the other presenters? There are four female therapists. I said, okay, well, what can I do that they can't? I'm an educator. I said, I'll teach them to learn Gemara, <laughs> then to be able to help the kids with the homework. It's not only that, but it's social. The kids come home, a 14-year-old kid, hey, how was your day? What'd you learn, sweetheart? Mm -hmm. Oh, ma, you know, you know, I'm gonna go. Ma, you know, you know, you know. So I, it's, it, it's, it's also fundamentals. It's just so much background information. Um, everything starts from the third floor. If you don't have the, you get the background information, you're done. You just have to understand the, the concepts of, we broke down the eight logical components they're all color coded, and we have examples for them. Um, in other words, a, a statement, a question, a, a proof, refuting the proof. All of them are color coded, and there's you're just training a bunch of lawyers. You're just you're fight, you're feeding you into go. the stereotype. You you're like, but, but look at the, look juxtaposition. At you're six years old. You need to know what these things are. Well, I, I used to, I used to tell the, I've been I've been yelling for the longest time that we're teaching. I'm doing a talk now. I'm doing a talk over Shuas. I'm going to be at YU's uh, Shuas program. So they gave me a, th uh, I have a few prime slots, and then I got a 3.15 a.m. slot, you know, right before, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, you know, when everybody's exhausted. Fighting Maslow's hierarchy right there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah right, everybody's horizontal. So the, the ta and I wanted a Gemara theme, so the, the topic is um, too much, too early, too fast. <laughs> That's the title. Are That's we, great. Are we rushing our children through beginner Gemara? And I, I passionately believe that we are. I think we should just slow down and teach the kids the fundamental skills that they need. That's amazing. So I think we're in 100 schools, thank God. Wow. We're in 100 schools. Okay, I hope if anyone from the school systems, yeshivas, are listening, you watch can look this. At, we have an Amazon page. If you look really? at Bright Beginnings, you can look at our Amazon page. Um, we have all of our safety books and, and, and Gemara books. We have some of them are, are available on, uh, actually on Apple. Um, my my YouTube page is at Yaakov Horowitz. All my talks are there. Um, I just started. Uh, now is going to next week's going to be a year. I just started um, trying to engage with the Gen Z parents, your age. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I realized, you know, I started doing parenting classes thirty years ago. So you're like faxing out. In fact, <laughs> but that's one of the barriers. That's one of the barriers I speak about in Gemara. I, I had actually. What are the barriers to learning Gemara? Okay, what are the barriers? It's Aramaic. It's Aramaic. Go ahead. Right. It's Aramaic, which is a foreign language. Go ahead. Uh, I don't understand a lot of the concepts. 
Okay, you don't understand the concepts, right? It's it's, it's abstract logic. I'm, I do a, I do a whole class on personality profiles also, you know, to see how you that because it really affects which parts you find difficult, right? So it's Aramaic. There's concepts there. Um, you might not know Hebrew. There's no punctuation, right? Oh, um, I, whenever right? I learn, I there's, put that in. There's the whole rel right. There's the whole we have them in the book. There's it's the whole relevance issue. Like, why am I learning this? Right. Why do I need to know this? Oh my God! You can imagine. I didn't I, want to bring that up. I don't, I don't, no. I don't know how far I could I go with my. You can say talk. anything. You. There's open space. I you always talk. told my students. Always, you can ask me anything. This is this is conversation. Faith, faith. If it's faith, if you say you don't believe that there was a that the, the sea was split, mm -hmm. talk about it. You can ask me. It's fine. We'll discuss it. If we don't know, we'll go together to someone who can answer better than I can. So it, I, tell me, what, what do you want to say about relevance? No, no, I'll, not I'll, Maslow. The Go fact ahead. that Yitzi is here, I, I, I've been doing this show with by myself solo, and I was always open to the idea of some of my friends, I think, are great at interviews. Yitzi has his own podcast. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great podcast. We'll, we'll include it in the show, show notes. And he just happened to, to be here today. Um, so I said, oh, I'm having Rav Yaakov Horowitz, and he Googled you. He's like, I'm like, do you want to? Co-host, is it sure? That that's what it was. But there's an interesting. No, I mean, I'm I'm really really grateful and thank you so much. Sure. And it's, I can't stress enough. Like the people that are like you are so rare, and you're just making the world a better place. And it's uh, absolutely. Do you want to talk personal? Tell me about the relevance. Tell me about the relevance. Yeah, Tell I me. mean, the relevance I think is very important. I I think you seem to come from a perspective of like fundamental belief that there's some kind of divinity you brought up like the splitting of the sea right. and i think that one issue is the relevance and i deeply believe that it's completely irrelevant i mean the whole thing other than you maybe, my talmud teaching right other than like the gemara you should have been in my class <laughs> I, I totally should have been in your class i probably would have went a different way but i um don't think that it's relevant at all other than from maybe a cultural or sociological perspective so okay that's fair you should, if you were in my class and you said that I would, I would discuss it with you in front, in front of everyone. Mm -hmm. In your places, we don't list them. Did they have that approach? But yeah, but, yeah, but, but <laughs> they but, did not. But, but, but in, fair, in, in fairness, they did in not. fairness, so I never walked into class. Uh, the, my students, my eighth grade students, never walked in without something on the board, or I'm dating myself, you know, on the board, mm -hmm. or, or they didn't have smart boards. That um, that was talking about the Gemara. That was talking about. I used to compare it to constitutional law. In other words, to give the children respect for this body of knowledge, you say, um, "Are you allowed to carry a, a you know, a semi-automatic gun, a, you know, an automatic pistol? Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Right to bear arms. What does that mean? Is it a militia? Or is it this?" So when we would talk about, in other words, you have people. We have a well-respected document, and people parse the words to try to understand the meaning. Mm -hmm. But I, I also used to, um, you, whenever whenever the Gemara would discuss a specific topic, I would I would make it something that was relevant to the children's lives. I would use mm -hmm. sports analogies. Mm -hmm. I, I give you an example. The, the, it talks about the laws of Shabbos, right? So if you, pick up, if you pick up something in a private domain, right, and you send it over to a, a public domain, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, it's a violation of the Sabbath. Is mm -hmm. it, is it? So I used to talk about f football. If you have your feet inside and, 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 you know, mm -hmm. and you're catching the ball outside, where does that go? There's a, a Gemara in, M M M in Makas I used to teach, Elon Basanov. The same thing with the tree. My kids used to roll their eyes. And, uh, but breaking the what was the concept in Makas? Elon Basanov, a, a, a person who kills accidentally has to oh, go to the city of guy? refuge. Right, right. right. So, so what happens if he's in a tree? The trunk of the tree is inside. The branches are outside. So if you're sitting on the tree, it doesn't mm. count. Does it go by the branches? Does it mm. go where you're sitting? Could you imagine the kids, my kids, rolling their eyes? And, oh, another thing we really need to know about, Rebbe. <laughs> so I would start off by I didn't. I would start off. But that's I, that's an empty analogy because football actually has practical relevance to people's <laughs> lives. <laughs> <that> people <laughs> are watching no, it. You're I'm like not, just trying to connect it to something that no, has no, some I, sort I, of I'm similar not, I'm not talking pattern. About, no, my my point was that what we're learning and the process that mm. we're going through. You can say that religion isn't meaningful to me. Mm. That that's a separate issue than if, if you accept that we're accepting this body of knowledge as our, as our as our north star, and we we live our life according to this mm. constitution that God gave us. So then, I'm just talking about parsing those words. Um, you see people do this in all areas of life. So in other words, I, I, I'm not discussing whether or not you should keep Shabbos or not. What I'm saying is that if we have a discussion in the Gemara about a tree, and, 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 you know, then you, that, 
that is analogous, it's similar to other discussion. Again, if you accept this, the Torah as our, mm-hmm. you know, we can have a discussion whether or not that's 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 uh, that's that's important or not. But the the body, the discussion of Gemara, which is analyzing text, becomes more meaningful when you explain to children that we do this in the Constitution and we do this in 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 other areas of life. You have a rule book, and and you know if you jump out of bounds and you throw the ball backwards, and you know. So, so, whatever. I, I, I think I, I, I find it very valuable to, uh, to engage with the children and try to whatever the barriers are to be honest and and reflect. I want to get you back on track. So you're saying that Go. you joined Instagram yes. in order to talk to the parents of today's generation who right. are there. Right. Are you on TikTok yet? Not yet. Not yet. Not I think I you should. Say, you notice I didn't say yo. No. Right. No, I'm. I'm. I'm really going with parents, but maybe one at a time. You this should be big, everywhere. This was yeah. a big. This was a very big step for me. You should know. Okay. You had a year. I have. I, you know. I have. I do. I do a retreat one day a year for myself. I turn off my phone. I just reflect, think what I'm doing, what my goals are, what I want to do before I hang up my sneakers. You know, I'm 62 years old. Thank God. For my, she do I, not look 62. I, I, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, my grandmother used to say, "Anad elter tzichnisht," that a fool doesn't grow old because there's <laughs> no problems. Anyway, so I think about what I want to do the, the rest of the years Hashem grants me, and and one of the things that jumped out at me that I felt I'm, I don't understand your life. I, I don't understand Instagram. I don't. I, I'm very familiar with the when I made cassette tapes. You know. <laughs> uh, the, we sold 100,000 copies, uh, you know, uh, God knows, uh, 30 years ago. Like a whole generation of parents raised their kids on that, but like, I don't understand. I go on Instagram, I get a headache, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, your generation doesn't know who I am. I don't know who you guys are. I don't understand it. So I, I promise, I really, I said to myself, Yankee, either you leave parenting, just do something else. There's other things I could do in my life. You want to stay in the game. You gotta gotta be where the people are. You're amazing. That's amazing. So I. It, this is so. This is so not. Good ma- for you. Yeah, I'm happy. Good I'm, for you. I'm That's incredible. I'm happy I did it. So I opened up an Instagram page, and I. That's s- why you look so young. I have been doing these. You have these moves. You're always changing. I started producing under a minute parenting clubs. Amazing. So we started a year ago. We did. We're up to 285. We have a new topic every week. It's Bright Beginnings Forum. Folks, look it up. My private page is at Yaakov Horowitz. I do all the other stuff there. I do a lot of you know lives and stuff. So we have I have four thousand followers on my page. We have uh, almost three thousand on the on the other page, and you know one of the things that struck me in the research and everything is that you know your generation, the fact that you're much more suspicious about information incoming stuff. Um, I trusted Dan Rather and Peter Jennings to, to you know when they told me the news. I read it and I yeah, I listened and I believed them. Mm-hmm. You got, if you have Fox News in one room and CNN in another room, it's like two different planets. So you guys make what we call in learning a Tzad Shava. You know, you agree, <laughs> none of them are believable. And, and especially the news that comes on, you trust 54% of people make purchases based on influencers. Why? Because you see them every day. Mm-hmm. You have your people you follow, you know them, you listen to them. If you don't like them, you, you don't follow them. But the ones you do, you have a connection with them. So I said, I got to become an influencer. Mm. If I want to, if I, I'm dead serious. Such a, such a serious. forward that's, thinking way. That's what I said. If I want to be relevant, if I want to help my grandchildren raise their kids, um, and then it's the only way, this is what the, it is I'm, what it is. I'm tending to not believe you though with school, like that you were a bad student because your cadence, the way that you carry yourself so calmly. I'm you're 62, so, my friend. You're saying you developed over time. Yeah. Mm. You you would say you were a wild child? <sighs> Really? Right? Yeah, yeah, I know. You see okay. right. I'm calmness. 62, right? So I, Yeah, but that doesn't... No, people no, grow, no, no, but they rarely look, change. I, I, look, look. Um, I always say that, that... I'm not saying I'm a successful person, but whatever, this, whatever those qualities that... For whatever success I've had in my life, every one of those qualities made me a terrible eighth grade student. <laughs> in other words, the quality of getting up at an Agoda convention in front of 4,000 people and... 300 rabbanim and a bunch of rashi yeshiva and talking about child sexual abuse or teens at risk means that I speak my mind. As the pioneer of it. Right. The first one up, or second, or third, whatever, means that I speak my truth and I'm not intimidated to say what I feel and you don't like it. So don't like it. It's okay. You know, we'll, we'll be friends. You can mm-hmm. disagree with me. Um, that doesn't do well when you're, when you're sitting in, in an eighth grade classroom, right? Hmm. Um, thinking out of the box doesn't work. Having I have... Thank God, a, a, 
very high, I'm a very high energy person. So, you know, that doesn't work either if I'm sitting, repeating back what people are telling me, you know, uh, all day long. So why do you think I would be a good student? I hear that. I hear that now. You did explain it better. So after Yassi's point, I'm going to end off with one question. Go for it, Please. Oh, is the... I love your 2.0, like the halo, we got a little taste of what else you're building, right. but is the first piece that you said being explicit with your parents and with your body, is that a microcosm of like a lot of your teachings in terms of the sexual abuse area? Right, I mean, the, those, the most important thing are those, those that original that body of knowledge. Block. 1.0 is the most important thing mm -hmm. to teach your children that you're entitled to your own space. And if somebody, it, it has to be the norm. If, if I ate at your home and, and you had people of all different ages, and ju just imagine, like, I, wrote, I took a piece of chicken with my hands, what age would have to, how old would someone have to be to giggle or say, like, well, it's this guy? Three-year-olds would start laughing already, right? Because mm -hmm. they know we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So if your children are raised in the culture that no one's allowed to touch you without permission or you can leave a situation where you're uncomfortable and someone puts an arm on your shoulder, you go like that, mm -hmm. just like you would act there. If that's the norm. The norm is that you have your own space. The norm is that there's good touching, bad touching. Mm. And the norm is that, you know, that no one has the right to make you feel uncomfortable. So then, when it happens, the children look. And like I said, oh, that's what, the, the most, this 2.0 is Yankee. This is my, mich not Michigan's, but mm. I, I think this is very, well. so these are, you get that? No, it's fine. This, For those who didn't, understand there's a phone ringing in the background. No, so, so there's a halo effect. There's, there's a theory of the just world means that we want to believe that the world is a good place. We don't want to believe that our next door neighbor could abuse kids or our uncle. We, and that, that's also an incredible bias. Then there's a whole thing of um, two, sec, you know, two seconds each. People, people um, one of the things is no secrets from parents, right? Mm -hmm. Which 15-year-old kid's going to tell a parent if someone starts up with them like at, at the most uncomfortable conversation in the world? Mm. So I, have, I do a whole class. It's called Tell Me Anything. That's amazing. What? That's amazing. I'm serious. I That's reserve the websites. Can't tell me anything. That <laughs> no, but yeah. training people to be explicit and open and transparent, and it builds like these connections and safety right. nets and bonding. It's incredible. Right. What you're one doing. of the things that they do. Cause I live in the real world. I mm -hmm. see what happens. You see, why didn't you go? Because I'm not gonna. I'm gonna tell. They, you know, there's a lot of research. God forbid, if someone's abused, right? So they usually, excuse me, excuse my French. They, they, you know, they get stimulated and they, they feel some sort. of arousal where they feel guilty they feel uncomfortable that's what the abusers count on so it's very confusing to them and they feel very embarrassed mm -hmm. so who the, who's going to talk to their parents so you have to have a culture and then it's probably the last people they ever want to talk to right about it so i do i have a whole class on that that's one of the two one, the biggest 2.0 thing i have is about uh, is about creating a culture at home where your kids can tell you anything and i've been bringing my daughter we have our youngest daughter is 25 26, she's a therapist now. So she comes along with me to the classes and I, I hand over Q&A to her. Because hmm. people say, so what does it mean? Your kids can't tell your parents anything, so they, they just let you run the house. So if they don't trust me, they, they got sorry. They got the thought. But, yeah. but um, like, I'm, I'm really working. I mean, now we're working on something over the next few weeks to really bring, bring to, to take it to the next level and to get people more involved. I want to be, I want to, uh, uh, a sign on every lawn that says we're a safe we're a child safety family you know we, we need to we don't telegraph it'd be it. bad if there's like 50 houses and 49 have it one dozen like <laughs> pedophiles yeah. would be like oh, hello abusers abusers I, I interviewed dr solomon here's a fantastic therapist here and there's a psychiatrist a genius um abusers groom communities just like they look for kids it's so dark what you're, you're some of the stuff you're talking about. But think it's about incredibly it. Incredibly dark. Think about it. Abusers groom communities. They also check which communities they can get away with this. So one of the things we're doing now is I'm we're in the middle of working on it now for my I'm doing a project right after Shavuos. Um I'm producing PDFs free downloadable pdfs that i want people to put in the shul in the bungalow colonies in their homes just saying we're a child safety place no touching listing the rules and if an abuser walks into a shul and he sees it there he's going to think twice right. and say hey these these folks are these folks are proactive so i think we need to be telegraphing this to to parents we need to send them this message we're doing a we have a project now um you can go it's childsafetybook.org childsafetybook.org in partnership with Artscroll, we're offering for bulk sales, we're offering a book at $5 a piece 
uh, free shipping. I got sponsors and donors to, to make up the difference. I want to get a book in every home, childsafetybook.org. So we're, Bless we're, your soul. We're doing, a, we're doing a push now to get the book in every home. So if you're out there, folks, um, get spunky, get a little angry, it's okay. And, and get feisty. We have to get feisty about this. We really need to, we need to get an attitude to this, that, 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 that the abusers, um, not just, not just they're not welcome, but that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna keep our eyes open. And if we see somebody tutoring a child alone in the shul, which is not a raw, it's not, it doesn't mean they're abusing them, but another thing, one of the things I want to do is make pro, to push for more protocols in schools and shuls. I'm sure in your law office you have rules of, rules of what you do and don't do. Or the mm -hmm. doctors have, you know, you, you're doing an examination, you bring somebody into the room. People shouldn't be tutoring in, you know, rooms by themselves. I shouldn't be taking somebody. <laughs> Last thing, I did a talk with Dr. Felkowitz right after the world thing. I did a, a number of, of lives, Instagram lives with you. So a woman raised her hand and she said, Rabbi Horowitz, how could I trust you and Dr. Felkowitz? And then she apologized four times, not one, not twice. I'm sorry. I said, it's a fair question. Thank you for asking it. So I said, if trust means that you think I'm an ethical person, I hope you trust me. If trust means that you think if I say something, I mean it, I'm honored. If you say trust means that if I said something, I did research to make sure that it's real, that I, that I appreciate. If trust means that you tell me to take your 12-year-old daughter across town at night by yourself, don't trust me. Don't trust Dr. Falkowitz. Don't trust anybody. So that's another message that that compelling. Should, wow. Yeah, I, I, it, so I'm trying to think of like you know I, I'm just thinking my life like there's babysitters that come to my home twofold. How how do how could how do people navigate that? Meaning how could you know the babysitters' parents trust the people they're going okay. to, and vice versa, the so babysitters and their kids. Start looking into it. Mm -hmm. Meaning, call the house. I'm leaving the house, mom. I'm I'm being driven home. I'll be home in three minutes. Right. There's ways around it. Right. Also, maybe nanny cams and stuff like whatever. that. Whatever. Whatever it is. I'm getting in the car. I haven't, I, you know, I'm, I'm, fa I'm live. I'm, I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm doing, you know. Wow. So I want to I wanna end off with, with this question of. I don't want to end off. I know, I know. I just said <laughs> that. I know, I know. day, we could go for four hours. I'll come back. Are not going to click on. He started on. schools I'll and like all this time. I know, I know, I know. And it. we're talking about it, like how active you are physically. Yes, um, that's very you interesting. Swim a mile a day. Got, we just talked what? about that before we got on. How you swim a mile a day on top of everything else you're doing. Look, but you know, starting a school, I, would, I could go five I, I, hours on that. I see that. I see that. Um, I golf. I, I golf. I love that. I play about eighty-five. Yeah, it's mm. not bad for a rabbi. But it was funny. I was looking at pictures with my wife. Uh, we were looking at old pictures. Uh, we had a thing on, a, on my computer. Uh, you know, a screensaver, and fifteen. 18 years ago, when I was golfing, I had three, four braces on. I had an elbow brace and two knee braces, and this, thank God, and what I, happened? I threw them all away. I work on my core. You know, if you if you work on if you work on your core, and you you, I could take. No, why do you need a brace? Because my my because I was I was 45. My body starts it starts uh, the warranties off. Wow. So you. I, I went to some personal trainers. Uh, I, I went through a period of like five, six years ago where I was, my, you know, I have a little arthritis, whatever it is. I, I, my body started compressing, you know, and, and, I, and I said, I'm, I don't want to live like that. I'm going to fight it. So I went, to, I went to at least five, six physical therapists till I found someone who understood it. And I have a program that I do. I, I do yoga and I, I, I exercise. I could take half a punch from you in my stomach. 50, 50%. We will not test that no, I'm not testing that either. Test that Personal out. space. No, but, <laughs> but, but the, the, the guys who are experts, the guys uh, that I, they, they all said that if you work on your core and, and you know, you, you strength. I, I hunch all the time. I need to work on my core. You're that, giving me chizek. I got this. So you got to have a... Yeah. 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 You know something? There's a fantastic book on PTSD. Um, I always ask when I speak to the experts, I always say, tell me your best book. I have... I read hundreds of them because, you know, I didn't go to any training or any school. Um, but there's a brilliant book. It's called Your Body Keeps the Score. The body keeps the score. If you, anyone suffering from PTSD or, or, or have a loved one who is, it is, oh, my God, breathtaking. But it's true in, in other areas also. The body keeps the score, you know. You can get by without exercising for a while, but then your body starts, uh, you start, you know, breaking down. 
So you're just, a beast, though. You regenerated your body. That's unbelievable. What's the choice? You know, what's plan B? I, I, I'm a pragmatic person. You know, I, I whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's also the fact that I start when I started dealing with abuse victims. I do an hour every day in nature just to get away because it's it's you know you I you know and a lot. I, I found myself really, I wouldn't say depression, but it was really wearing on me. And, and uh, in every area, if you deal with law stuff and you're dealing with matrimonials, it makes you crazy. Um, be self-aware. Your body keeps a score. And, and what I did was I actually went to, I went to um, a friend of mine who runs a college, an online college, and I said, look, what, what do people do? The therapists do stuff. I, I didn't, I'm not, so they have wellness classes. He said, they have wellness classes. So I said, what's that? So he says, you know, we... Mm-hmm. So I, I, and I, was, I, I felt that I needed this. So I said, look, uh, he, he was a Talmud of mine. I, I, I said, look, I, I'll, I'll gladly pay. I can't take the whole course. Can I take that piece? I'll pay for it. No, he says, no, I can't. So he brought me into class. I, I went for sessions on, on wellness. And, and it, it's called vicarious trauma. Like, there's wow. a thing called, it's a thing. In other words, if you listen to trauma, you, of course, you're not as, it's not, God forbid, like the person who has the trauma, but... You absorb it. You absorb it, and yeah. it really gets it. Gets and your body it, keeps the score. Right? And your body keeps the score. So yeah. it, but they, they had us actually take up... They, this person, they brought in a, a, a victim of, of domestic violence, spoke to us, and we, we, were, pre- we were taking out our blood pressure. It was off the charts. And we, I didn't realize it even. You know, so they make you more self-aware and what your triggers are. and So I, it's all part of it. You need to take care of yourself. Mm. It, 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 it doesn't... I saw a study that really was, if you want to know, it just, there was a study, uh, a longitudinal study, and, and, um, that, that said that um, people who exercise live about, on the average, like five, six years longer than people who don't. That's but, depressing me. <laughs> but the deterioration starts 20 years before death oh on the people who don't exercise. I look, look around, you'll see it's true. The deterioration starts... 20 years before death, and if people are active, it starts five years before their death. So it's not only the, the of, of course, these are averages, but look around, you see that, that, that they, um, it's that deterioration that I was really, um, look, it's that, body keeps the score. You don't, so true. You don't, feed, the, you don't feed the meter, you know, you know, that's <laughs> it. Okay, so I want to end off with this question that you've, you've shared a story actually with us, but I'm sure there's many stories, moments in your life that has affected you personally. What's one story you could share that had the biggest impact on you? Or, or was, in what way? What do you mean by? Um, you me most probably I'm not dealing. Sure you, not sure what you asked. Probably dealing. Let's say, like you know, seeing like dealing with people that were you know molested or raped and stuff like that, and you saw something, and I don't know if it maybe gave you hope after or something. I'm looking for something inspiring. You got me thinking. Okay. You want something inspiring? Mm-hmm. People at large don't realize how profound it is for a survivor when you stand with them. That realization was, was overwhelming. In other words, um, you, you, people who suffer trauma feel marginalized. Parents who are struggling with any issue... And, and I'm not comparing them, God forbid. I'm saying I've been doing a lot of work the last five, seven years with helping parents of LGBTQ kids, you know, because they, they, they feel very lonely and they, they, many of them, not, many of them, they don't know how to figure it out, who to talk to, how to, how I spoke to, to parents on the way here, you know. But, so people feel very lonely. And um, in, in the case of abuse, the, the, one of the things that they that the abusers do that's so evil is that after they abuse the kids and after the children deteriorate, then they turn to them and say, "You're going to believe that druggie over me." That's what they say. That's what that's what they say. It's in the kinos of Tishabov that we say that 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 uh, one of the kinos of Tishabov, the lamentations on on uh, the destruction of the temple. It says that that like the Romans came in and they forced every they took away food and they put them under siege and then when they did bizarre things to stay alive, they would publicize it. Like, you know, they were eating the flesh of the dead bodies. So they, that's what says that they, not only that, but they, so the, these abusers, that's what really ticks me off. They turn when, when there's an accusation, almost invariably that one who's making an accusation has a very difficult life. They say, you're going to believe him or her over me? What? It's gonna, yeah, I don't want to say the, the pejoratives that they say. 
and <clears throat> that will, that makes them less likely to report and and standing with them makes all the difference in the world it, it, it's it's almost it's almost you say i really should do more of this you know when you sit there and 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 someone goes through a difficult situation or they're just struggling with something at home they're struggling with their own uh, dealing with an addiction an addiction in a family member going through a divorce you know well, people are alone they feel long, they feel alienated and they, some of them hopefully have good friends that they can talk to um, but that, that's the most inspiring thing that I could say is that when you see someone going through a challenge, when you see someone who's lonely, don't say anything because you're probably going to say something foolish because we don't know what to say. Just, I'm here for you. That's it. Just think, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I, my wife and I have been volunteering for eight years before of COVID. We spend Rosh Hashanah and Kippur with recovering addicts. I, I got very emotional during one part of davening. So I put my head and I say, and I listened to a lot of stuff all year. So I try to keep it in. And sometimes it bubbles out a lot. I just totally lost it. And I was saying, well, I had my head down. I was crying, whatever. Three kids came over to me within five minutes. <laughs> it's hysterical. Three kids. When was the last time you saw like a, an 18-year-old comforting a 50-year-old rabbi? <laughs> it was hysterical. They came over. Two of them just tapped me on the shoulder. And one of them said, you know, Rabbi, um, I'm here for you. You can come talk to me anytime over Yantu, over Rosh Hashanah. You know, because that's the culture there. Why? Because everybody's in the same boat and they need support. So I got to tell you something. It, it's crazy. I felt good. Wow. <laughs> Isn't it weird? You know, I have a beautiful life, thank God. I felt, it made me feel better. So, you know, we think we need to say wise things. Dr. David Pelkowitz told me, that years and years, he was one of my mentors. He said, Yankee, when people come to you and talk to you about stuff going on, they don't expect you to solve the problems. They just want to be validated. They want you to hear, they want, you, they want to be validated. So I tell everybody, you don't know what that means to, to someone who's struggling. So if you see someone and someone in the neighborhood has something and you heard about it and you don't know if you should say, you shouldn't say, you know, you, which is perfectly normal, just go over and just, Put a hand. Lift a lonely spirit. Rabbi Yaakov, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. I hope, uh, I hope you folks um, had some good takeaways. A lot. Anytime, guys. Be well. Thank you. Thank you for listening or watching to this week's episode. Please go in the show notes and check out uh, the links that we have for Rabbi Horowitz. It's it's what he's doing is is an unbelievable thing for the world, and we're really appreciative that he came on to discuss it all with us. And you'll just look out for him. He's going on tour. Follow him on Instagram. He's great at what he does, and I love his content. I I, I always check out his Instagram videos, and he's unbelievable. If you enjoyed this episode and think anyone else that you know could get some value out of it please share it with one person or two people. Until next time, keep on being inspirational. Living L'chaim.